So when we look at water scarcity, it is uh, the number one global security risk. It is very possible that uh, there can be a military conflict. Global Arms, a new take on security policy by DW. Isha, water is life. That sounds so cliche, Louis. <laughs> I, know, I know. But coming from Florida, uh, this you know great state in the United States, uh, we are regularly bombarded by hurricanes, and they often leave a devastating trail of destruction in their wake. And sometimes that entails uh, water cutoffs. So sometimes they're daily, sometimes they're weekly. But in one case, I remember one where it was m one month without water. You and were without water for a month. Yeah, yeah. How did you survive? So you almost don't because you can't take showers, you can't wash, you can't clean, you really can't do anything. And it just, it's these kind of moments where you realize like how critical water is to life. Now, I haven't been in such a critical situation, but uh, I've grown up in India in different uh, cities, big and small both. And depending on where you are, sometimes you don't have water for the whole day. Like you don't have a 24-7 supply of water. So mm -hmm. you get a kind of a timetable that today you're going to have water supply from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Mm -hmm. And that's the time when you have to do your dishes, you take a bath. And most of the houses, they have a water tank on the roof and they make sure that the water tank is full and those two hours are really used properly. Wow. No, that's interesting that you're speaking about water tanks because, I mean, it just shows that this is kind of planning for the future, right, for, for your water supplies and access to it. And when I think about states, I mean, they also have these concerns. These are some of the reasons why they're building dams, right? They want to create reservoir waters, ensure their water security. I mean, this is, uh, you know, a, a kind of big issue, right, for, for countries. That's right. And countries make or build dams. And China is the country that has the maximum number of dams. I mean, you don't even know how many are there. I uh, went on to research and some websites told me 80,000, others told me 90,000. So while we talk, maybe about 100,000 dams are there in China right wow. now. And some of them are actually, um, they're leading to conflict because some of the, these dams, they are on near the border of India and China. So there's this LAC line of actual control. So India and China, they don't have a clear border, but there's right. a line of actual control. And some of these uh, dams, they are actually near this border. Well, that's fascinating. And to, to hear that water can really become a source of conflict between two states. And I think that's actually the question that we will be answering today, hopefully. Could conflict with China make taps in India run dry? I'm Isha. I'm Lewis, and this is Global Eyes where we are unpacking security policy, taking it out of the ivory tower and making it relevant, making it make more sense for you. So the Tibetan Plateau is one of the world's most important water reservoirs. And it's important for China, but also India. And these two countries share this contested border. That's right. And a lot of water that comes from the Tibetan Plateau that flows into India, the Brahmaputra River, is very important there. But at this border, I mean, there are skirmishes. A couple of weeks ago, I saw this incredible video of Indian soldiers, Chinese troops battling it out with bamboo sticks. And I mean, it's just incredible when you think of China, India, two nuclear powers, and they're fighting. They're having fist fights. Two nuclear powers having fist fights. That's and crazy. you know, the only one, a lot of people, especially on the internet, they're asking, what's going on? So. To answer that question, to understand that better, what's going on, let's bring in our first guest, and that's Antara Ghoshal Singh. She's a fellow at the Strategic Studies Program of the Observer Research Foundation, and she's joining us today from New Delhi. Antara, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining. So, Antara, what is going on at the border? Hi, and uh, thank you so much for inviting me for this uh, discussion. You know, it's really a pleasure for me to be here today. And uh, about uh, what is happening uh, at the China-India border, yes, uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, the situation is really volatile over there and there is a lot of tension um, building up between both the countries. And as you know that, you know, the relationship uh, between both the countries um, 
kind of plummeted uh, since the Galvan Valley clash in uh, 2020, June 2020. And, uh, you know, um, it was although it was like, as you mentioned, like fistfights and all, but then uh, 20 soldiers from the Indian side uh, died in the clash. And uh, according to the um, the Chinese official figures, uh, some four Chinese soldiers uh, lost their lives. And uh, uh, whereas, like you know, unofficially, I mean, people say different things and uh, different quote they, they quote different numbers. So it is uh, quite serious a situation. And uh, the sad part is, uh, you know, th there is no solution. Uh, particularly in sight as of now. And where do these tensions kind of start? Where, where do they begin? Where do they stem from? What I see while, uh, you know, uh, while studying Chinese literature, uh, you know, there is a um, lot of competition or a lot of insecurity among the Chinese side about, uh, particularly after the uh, 2020, uh, you know, the start of the pandemic and, uh, the Sino-U.S. relations, um, you know, having a downward spiral in the Sino-U.S. relation, having trade war and technology war. There is a lot of insecurity in the Chinese side that um, India might be uh, taking advantage of the situation or gaining from the situation uh, or, uh, you know, posing uh, or, or taking away business from China. You know, there are, uh, even if you look at Chinese internet right now, you can see there is so much of insecurity about um, India becoming uh, or India replacing China as uh, number one in the uh, in in terms of population, uh, particularly having the largest walking age uh, population. Um, secondly, about you know about companies like Apple moving in from China to India, uh, then about, you know, um, closer ties between uh, India and the United States, both militarily as well as economically. So there is a lot of insecurity. And uh, if you look at Chinese literature and what Chinese uh, strategists are saying, you will see that their focus is not so much on the border dispute rather than on the competition with India in the development issues you know so you've talked about the border conflict and you've also talked about the insecurities but at the same time uh, trade with china has only been increasing and uh, 2022 it was actually a uh, record high that we saw trade increased imports from china to india increased by 21 percent mm -hmm. so how do you see that how do you explain that rather that there are these skirmishes there are these conflicts on the border you have soldiers dying you mentioned 20 soldiers died and then you also have trade despite the insecurities. How does this all really uh, come together? This is true, you know, and um, uh, dependence on China, it's not just India, you know, all over the world. If you look at other countries also, uh, there is so much of dependence on China uh, economically and uh, particularly after the COVID crisis and the and the disruptions in the supply chain, you know, there is a uh, there is a consciousness all over the world, not just in India, uh, that uh, there should be a model where a China plus model, you know, where there is no... Um, um, uh, total dependence on only one country where supply chains get disrupted in a in a situation like uh, like pandemic so uh, you know there is um, dependence yes there is dependence but there is also a lot of um, uh, consciousness or awareness within india that uh, we need to diversify we need to uh, be more self reliant we need to look at uh, other countries and also to develop india's uh, manufacturing sector now on the china side there are great demands for energy, water. We see infrastructure projects happening in and around the border area, contested border territory. And um, so when, when people think about the, the kind of downstream effects of, for example, putting up dams and whatnot, I mean, on the Chinese side, they would probably say, hey, it's legitimate. We need this energy. We need the power. What, what can you tell us about that? What, what are they thinking and, and, and how can they kind of maybe look at a, a way to resolve some of these issues or concerns that downstream countries have. 
So, uh, yes, it is a very valid question. You know, there is a lot of concern in India presently on uh, what, uh, on, on particularly on um, uh, the uh, damming of Brahmaputra and um, China's uh, water uh, politics, basically. India, uh, not just now, but uh, since, since last many years, you know, under various governments, they have tried to uh, engage China on this issue to have a, uh, to have an institutional arrangement with uh, China. China on this issue. Uh, they have also tried to internationalize the issue, but uh, to limited uh, uh, results, you know, to limited success. So what now the uh, government is planning to do is to invest more in, um, you know, developing hydropower uh, or, or uh, you know, um, uh, more dams and more, uh, uh, you know, water connectivity projects in the Indian side, uh, particularly in the northeastern states like, uh, like um, Arunachal or like Assam, you know, uh, because and it actually is it is because of the Indian concern that um, Chinese actions might cause, uh, you know, um, a flood-like situation in India, or it might just divert the water, uh, you know, away from India. So these concerns are leading to, you know, um, India's focus or India focusing more on uh, developing, uh, you know, um, new dams in the uh, in the uh, right. Uh, but Antara, it's... do you do you think that's practically possible that China can use water as a weapon? and uh, lead to floods or droughts in the lower riparian countries, whether it's India or Bangladesh or Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, for that matter. Do you think that's practically possible for a country to do? Or is it just pa part of those conspiracy theories that we read on the internet and social media? See, as I told you, uh, there I gave you an example in 2017, just after the Doklam crisis, you know, uh, China refused. Of course, they gave some other, um, you know, excuse for not sharing the hydrological data, but they did not share the hydrological data. And it is only in 2018 when, uh, you know, uh, so, uh, the relationship between the two countries uh, kind of, you know, um, there was some betterment in the relationship between the both countries. Uh, then only they agreed to share uh, those data. So uh, you cannot just say that these are hearsays or it cannot happen. It can happen, you know, it can happen. But um, one thing I also wanted to uh, add is um, about the, um, the water issue, basically. So, uh, you know, um, if you read uh, Chinese literature, you would know that uh, using water as a coercive tool is not the ultimate objective of any state. So what they want to do actually is to sell that electricity to the Indian market. So that comes to a wider, uh, uh, you know, uh, subject of China's Tibet policy. Um, if you uh, look at what Chinese strategists are talking about Tibet is not the security aspect of it or the Tibetans, um, the, the Tibetan community and all, not so much focused on those issues. You know, what they are focused on is the economic challenge that Tibet uh, is presently think and what they propose to do is to come up with a South Asia corridor that is a corridor an economic corridor which will connect Tibet to the uh, to the um, uh, you know more popular uh, or sorry uh, to the to the um, uh, the populous, uh, you know, Indian market. So it is only by connecting Tibet to the Indian market. What they say is like it's no more possible for uh, for China to develop Tibet in a, in a closed way, in a in a cut off situation. It needs to be connected with the world. And where do you connect Tibet? I mean, how do you connect Tibet to the world? You can only do it through India because it's so close to India. And then this is this huge market which is close to Tibet. So they want Tibet and also the other Western provinces to to um, you know get better connected with the Indian market to utilize India's resources to develop itself to develop uh, pillar industries um, like hydropower industry you know so the original motive is to sell that electricity to to India but um, unless that kind of uh, you know materializes so uh, they tend to use it as a as a coercive tool to to force India to accept the Chinese uh, Chinese proposal. So is it possible that these tensions at the border could spill over and turn into a military conflict? 
uh, it is very possible that uh, there can be a military conflict. You know, uh, as I mentioned earlier as well, uh, you know, um, you know, China in their relationship how china sees the uh, relationship with india is not just uh, you know um, they do not think the real conflict with india is at the lac the real conflict is at the uh, is at the development level you know is at the um, is in india's um, aspiration to compete with china or to to catch up with china that is where the real conflict lies and um, what i gather from uh, what the uh, chinese strategists have been talking is that we have once throttled India's great power ambition. That means that uh, in 1962, if you remember, there was this huge competition between China and India about uh, about who is going to lead the the third world or who is going to lead the uh, the Asian countries. Yeah. So, uh, so the the narrative or the discourse is that we have once throttled its um, uh, great power ambition, and we are going to. And the time has come that we are going to do the same. We have to throttle its great power ambition, and that's why you see so much of tension building up at the border. And it's very possible. And at the present situation, it's it's very possible that it can um, escalate further, and uh, you know it can it can lead to a it, it can lead to a more um, difficult situation, a graver situation. Right. So on the Chinese side, you have concerns about strategic competition and economic development. On the Indian side, you have concerns about water scarcity and what that means for agriculture down the downstream. Antara, fascinating insights. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks a lot. So Lewis, to sum it up and to put things in context, China is upstream controller of seven of South Asia's mightiest rivers, and if I may name them, it's Indus, Ganges, Brahmaputra, Iravati, Salween, Yangtze, and Mekong. And these are very wow. important rivers. We've been talking about Brahmaputra, but there are also these other rivers. And um, China is uh, upper riparian state. That means it controls the water, and there are other states, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Laos, so all of them, they are lower riparian and they are worried that China might control the waters. And that's what Antara confirmed, that if China wanted, it could actually, with its dams, it could control. Now, um, China has been blamed for, for droughts in Thailand and Cambodia. And um, we've been talking about dams. So I read somewhere that dams that ensure one country's water supply risk um, that the other country gets droughts. So right. it really, this whole constellation where uh, the South and Southeast Asian countries, they are scared of what China might do. That's quite intriguing. Yeah, this idea that Antara was talking about, the fact that she believed, uh, and other experts, uh, from my understanding, believe that water could be the source of military conflict between the two countries is really astounding. Um, and I think though, hearing more of, of the analysis that she was providing, I think the fact that in China, there is this huge discourse, especially among strategists that actually, you know, let's not look at it in the lens of a military conflict, let's look at economic development, and more so let's look at strategic competition. Now, when you, we usually hear these words, strategic competition, you know, we're like, what, what does that mean? It's always between the U.S. and China. But rarely do you hear about it between China and India. But in this case, I mean, they're actually saying, look, we may want to consider throttling Indi India's economy or their economic development because they pose a direct threat to our economic development. And I think that is a very kind of powerful outlook to govern relations, and I think it makes it incredibly difficult to overcome some of these greater issues, such as water scarcity, access to water, or even trying to resolve or come to a better solution regarding the contested border between these two countries. So I think the only way they could resolve is by at least having a treaty. Mm -hmm. And I was reading, uh, according to UN figures, since 1948, there have been more than 300 treaties on international waters um, throughout the world. But India and China, they do not even have one treaty. There are a few MOUs, but there's a difference between memorandum of understanding. There has not been any treaty between these two countries, which right. are like one third of the world's wow. population. Yeah. Yeah. And why is that so? Why are India and China not signing a treaty? To understand that, 
I think we should bring in our second guest. So we have with us Farwa Amir. She is research analyst for energy, water and sustainability at the Stimson Center. Farwa is joining us from New York today. Farwa, welcome to the show. Welcome to Globalize. Thanks for your time. I would straight away like to ask you, what is it? Why is it that India and China, they do not have any treaty? Even India and Pakistan, they have a treaty over Indus River. So what's happening between India and China? Why can't they sign a treaty? Interesting question. Very good question. And all of us in the water community always um, uh, have to reckon, you know, why there is none. Uh, but first of all, thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here joining you guys and talking about this. Um, what we keep on pushing for as a part of, you know, being being in those sort of water experts of looking at the way the world and hydro diplomacy is shaping up, we are always kind of calling for countries to come together by the means of a treaty or an agreement that can help them cooperate, that puts a legal binding on how they come together on provisions and there is an equitable sharing between upstream and downstream countries. Uh, now in China and in India's case, we're talking about the Brahmaputra River, uh, predominantly which is also known as the Yarlong Songpo River. And over there, China is head, is upstream. It controls the headwaters, India's downstream, um, and there is no sharing agreement between the two countries, which means there is always going to be a concern about those rivers being strategized or securitized or politicized uh, uh, in terms of, you know, if there is a political escalation or military escalation between the two countries and between China and India, who have strained relations, you would want to have some sort of a, a mechanism that supports their uh, shared natural resources to be at least uh, be in a more cooperative manner than the politics between the two countries. Um, there is none for a number of reasons. Firstly, because China is a country that uh, doesn't come into agreements very easily. Uh, you know, uh, to be honest, it's a country that is not open to uh, coming to signing legal binding agreements with its share in you know, riparian countries that puts them in a position where they have to comply by certain rules and regulations. When the UNACE convention had come up in um, you know, 1992, and again, the UN Water Courses Convention in 1997, which both kind of support the idea of cooperative uh, agreements between countries, especially transboundary waters involved, um, to come, come into terms and to have like a more equitable, equal sharing mechanism, um, China was actually opposed to it in the first mm. go in 1992, uh, even though it abides by some provisions. And then India has not ratified the agreement either, so uh, the convention either. So that's why there's a bit of a gap there, uh, even by international law. Uh, even uh, if you take that away and you just look at what's happening bilaterally, there have been no agreements because there are, um, you know, deep rooted political issues. There is a lot of mistrust between the countries and there's always going to be a concern. And it goes back in, uh, to, to the um, longest period of history you can imagine. And you look at China and India, uh, especially you have a disputed border in between. Right. Uh, so that always creates problems and that reflects on how shared natural resources work out between these countries. Uh, and that's a problem. That's something that we want to talk, you know, we want to move the conversation away from. It shouldn't be politicized and it should be looked at as a natural resource that is the lifeline of billions for both China and for India. Uh, and there's a lot of like, of course, we can go into the hydrology of it or what can happen, what cannot happen. But as by the virtue of, you know, how the countries come together, uh, even if there is no bilateral agreement that can uh, support uh, an equitable governance sort of mechanism for these countries over Brahmaputra, they do have their own memorandum of understanding, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, allows for some sort of you know information sharing, hydrological data sharing. So it's not all debt. Uh, between India and China. But Parva, sorry, uh, what's the point of having the MOUs if uh, you can't enforce them? There are two things. One, they are a gesture of goodwill. You know, you, it shows that you know, countries are willing to cooperate. Even if China comes to sign MOU, it's a, it's a good sign. It's a sign that there is, um, while there might be some sort of reservation to formally sign something and be backed by international law to comply by it, uh, there is going to be uh, some sort of uh, dialogue always with their neighboring countries vis-a-vis -vis the MOU. So that is a step in the right direction while you always have that need to do way more uh, in terms of action uh, and in terms of uh, application for, for, for a river like Brahmaputra. 
All right, well, you're involved in what they call track two dialogue sometimes, from, from my understanding, which is effectively back-channel diplomacy, kind of talks between states that are happening behind the scenes, not through official forums. Now, what can you tell us about that? I mean, is there political will between countries like China, India, and other downstream countries uh, to kind of find a lasting solution to this, to this uh, issue of water? So when we look at water scarcity, it is uh, the number one global security risk. Whether it's too much water, whether it's too little water, uh, it's creating both socioeconomic and political uh, uh, threats for countries all around the globe, I would say. So track to diplomacy, in my experience, has worked out well because when you try to bring countries together, the same South Asian countries together on political issues, there's a lot more um, resistance, there's a lot more inhibition to come to table. But when you try to bring them together on what we now call you know, non-traditional security threats uh, like water or climate, there is willingness to come to the table and have conversation. And uh, one of the projects, like first dialogues that we did, the water security in the Himalayan region project that we lead, um, one of the first dialogues, we even had China on the table. Do you think UN or the World Bank yeah. should be involved or could they really uh, reach a solution? Because it's clear now that unilaterally or even bilaterally, uh, both the countries, they're actually not going to reach any solution. So do you think that could be one way out? Specifically for South Asia, um, we have a great example in World Bank playing a role in arbitrating the treaty between India and Pakistan, which is one of the most successful water sharing agreements that have you know, kind of like stood the test of time, stood the test of two wars between right. India and Pakistan. So that as an international agency coming in and helping or to mitigate the problems over um, something that is so crucial uh, that's in this river between these two countries has been a successful example. Speaking of water scarcity, we've seen kind of the consequences in India before. So in, Ch in Chennai, we saw in 2019, uh, the city was basically had their water reservoirs uh, dried up. Now, and uh, we've seen some of the situations that could come out of that. I think in one case, there was a woman who was stabbed by her neighbor because the neighbor was saying that you can't have access to the water well at this certain time now. Uh, could we see this on a larger scale, like cities in India having their the taps run dry because China is curtailing access to water? Oh, um, China curtailing access to water will be a very bold statement. Um, we um, do have the episode of Chennai as an example of, you know, hit, I mean, the city almost hitting day zero. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is there, there, there are actually two sides to the question you just asked. One being what is happening on state level, city level, mm -hmm. and uh, country level for, uh, because of shared water resources or just, just scarcity that's being exacerbated by climate change or how um, cities have failed to manage water in an equitable sharing way. So some, some areas are saving more water than the other, some populations being marginalized in this aspect. Um, so India's water scarcity problems um, on a very national level, you can take them away from what is happening or what China can do and just look at them nationally and try to resolve them nationally. There's a lot that can be done. But when China can control, curtail water or no, uh, see, we, we need to understand the Brahmaputra, uh, we talked about sharing mechanisms, we talked about conventions, we talked about treaties, but India and China uh, sharing the Brahmaputra River it's, we, we, un, we know that in China's upstream and China has a larger control over the basin um, of the Brahmaputra River. The basin just falls in, in China's region a lot more. But how much does China really contribute to the river is something that we need to look from the hydrology aspect. And going by the hydrology aspect, China falls, the region that over the basin area of the Brahmaputra that falls under China is actually in the rain shadow area. So its contribution in terms of precipitation to the river flows is much lesser than the contribution of India and Bhutan, for example, because they lie in higher precipitation areas and Brahmaputra is fed by monsoons or rainfall fed river. So with that in mind, even if China was to divert waters on its end, there will be precipitation coming from India's side that will be supporting river flows downstream. Um, the concern is less about oh, what, when, how, and when can in China curtail water. I think it's more about the infrastructure development uh, that China is uh, is going about doing in, in the Brahmaputra. We do know that 
China can very well, through the infrastructure development, can, can control how the rivers flow, the timings of the river flow. Mm-hmm. And that is something that can lead to, of course, flood risks downstream. And that is a big, bigger concern for India. And China is highly dependent on hydropower. China is the biggest manufacturing hub in the world. And by 2060, it also has this um, net zero carbon emission target. So it's going to depend even more on hydropower. Do you think that's sustainable? Well, China has a lot of its own water problems. Um, if you looked at uh, its population, if you looked at China internally, it has severe water scarcity issues and it's trying to do what it's going to do. Um, it, it's always um, you know, looking to forward its energy game and that's why hydropower is seen as a renewable source of energy uh, in order to cut down the carbon emissions is definitely a rather you know, giant leap towards hydropower development. Um, and there are a number of, of course, controversial dams that are on uh, the Brahmaputra, including the super dam um, that was announced on the Great Bend. Um, in 2021. So so there are so many um, projects that are underway that are supposed to help China producing more renewable energy and hydropower is something that it comes up. Is it sustainable uh, as a form of energy? That, that's a bit up for debate because hyd- hydropower dams, the way they are built, um, do, I mean, we can get specific about the hydropower dams that are being built on Brahmaputra, for example, the Great Bend. Um, that's being built in a seismic zone, which is very prone to earthquakes. Mm. So when you have an infrastructure development and intervention in that part of the river, which is in the seismic zone, you've had episodes of earthquake and landslides before, that's going to be very harmful if you know an earthquake happens, uh, a possible flooding and drummage and the kind of like dam breaching that might take place and what our impacts it might have, not only for that locality, but downstream as well. Um, that is of concern. So it, it is destructive to the ecology of the river, destructive to the biodiversity, and of course, it's going to affect the communities downstream. Thank you so much, Fava, for the insights. It was really helpful to understand what the whole trouble is all about, what's going on in the region, and especially the water crisis. That's right. Thank you so much, Fava. Thank you for having me. So my understanding is whether sustainable or not sustainable, China needs hydropower. And for that, it will continue doing what it's doing. But before we conclude, let me just quickly go through the chronology of what's happening between India and China. And of course, for that, I'm not going back to the 1940s or 50s. For that, (laughs) we need another show. Uh, I just want to go back um, this decade, maybe, when Modi became the prime minister, so 2014, just so people understand what's happening. And Mm -hmm. it's quite confusing to understand what's happening. Mm -hmm. 2014, Narendra Modi becomes the prime minister. And that's when Xi Jinping visits India. And you see these are like buddies, uh, really good friends. And uh, you get the 1950s vibe of Hindi Chini Bhai Bhai. That was the slogan in India, which meant Indian Chinese, they're brothers. And all of a sudden, everybody thought, oh, okay, we're going to be good friends. Um, 2015, Modi went to China. 2016, trade ties, they became even stronger. But 2017, that's when Doklam crisis happened. Mm -hmm. That's near the border of Arunachal Pradesh. And then things changed all of a sudden. 2018, the tensions continue. 2019, India bans Chinese apps. And Prime Minister Narendra Modi says, we got to be self-reliant. Uh, he gave the slogan of Atmanirbhar Bharat, which means self-reliant India. So we don't right. need anything from China. 2020, we have clashes in the Galwan Valley, which is near the border of Ladakh. It gets even worse. 2021, after 45 years, we hear um, bullets being fired on the border, the LSE, which has not happened in the last 45 years. So here we have these buddies together and then we have uh, the tensions at at the bottom on the border excuse me and yet after all of this in 2022 as we talked uh, earlier the economic ties they grow and now we have these record figures that india and china they have their trading partners so it's very confusing you have this um, love-hate relationship between uh, Modi and Xi Jinping. Now, Modi is uh, the only prime minister who's um, visited China five times. Even uh, Xi Jinping has come to India three times. And they've met each other for more than uh, a dozen times in various meetings. And it is very confusing for people what's happening because this is what we see. Mm-hmm. We don't know what's happening behind the scenes. Right. And and I think the fact that these tensions are kind of happening, starting to happen in public over the past couple of years, I think kind of takes away from some of the things that <clears throat> Farwa was mentioning about 
track to dialogue, the fact that this is the stuff that's happening behind the scenes, these diplomatic back channel routes, and the fact that in this track to dialogues, there is the beginnings of cooperation. They're signing these memorandums of understanding. They're having these agreements on how to communicate when there's a crisis, how shall we dictate when something happens, how can we I don't want to go as far to say cooperation, but we're almost getting there. And for me, I think that could that's a potential sign that if things are happening behind the scenes are actually going pretty well, that could be the foundation in the future for a potential treaty or or at least it's gearing up towards that. Now, what's interesting is that this year Beijing is going to be hosting the UN's 2023 Water Convention. And this is a, a massive, massive, massive opportunity for China, uh, also India, other, other countries to come out and say, okay, we're going to try to resolve these disputes regarding water and kind of move forward. And that would be a huge signal to Beijing, to the rest of the world at a time where strategic competition, war, hot war, conflict is happening uh, in a lot of areas for them to say, actually, we're going to choose another route. We're going to choose cooperation. And for that, it will be really important that they start trusting each other because at the moment, there's a lot of mistrust. And hence, you see all of these conflicts. And we know that India and China, they have other problems. Like Antara in the beginning, she also mentioned that there is an insecurity in China that India is growing. And maybe these insecurities, they lead to other conflicts. And so also in this case, probably water is becoming an excuse. It's becoming a proxy for the other tensions that are there. So the way I understand uh, whether taps in India will turn dry, um, not as of now, not immediately. And there's hope. Things can get better. There are tensions between both the countries, but there's hope that things would be better. Right. There are yeah. things happening behind the scenes, and they're apparently being pretty successful. So, um, yeah big opportunities along the way and uh, yeah, looking forward to them, to see them develop. Yeah. There are things happening behind the scenes. So what do you think? Let us know. If you're watching this on YouTube, then let us know. What do you think? Can these tensions actually lead to taps running dry in India? And if you're listening to us on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts, do remember to subscribe to us. Thank you for listening to us. This is Isha. Lewis. We're signing off. Thank you. Have a good one. Global Arms, a new take on security policy by DW.